Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our daily devotion for Friday, October 30th, 2020. What a joy it is to be able to spend this time together in God's word with you today as the Lord uses his word to strengthen our faith in him and draw us closer to our Savior. We begin today by reading a portion of Psalm 90. For we are consumed by your anger. We are terrified by your wrath. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days ebb away under your wrath. We end our years like a sigh. Our lives last 70 years, or if we are strong, 80 years. Even the best of them are struggle and sorrow. Indeed, they pass quickly and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger? Your wrath matches the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. Lord, how long? Turn and have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your faithful love so that we may shout with joy and be glad all our days. Make us rejoice for as many days as you have humbled us, for as many years as we have seen adversity. Let your work be seen by your servants and your splendor by their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be on us. Establish for us the work of our hands. Establish the work of our hands. Yesterday, Moses referenced a song that the Lord wanted him to teach the people of Israel, not only as a warning to them about what would happen to them if they turned away from him, but also as a reminder of God's incredible faithfulness to them in spite of their unfaithfulness to him. In our Old Testament reading for today, we hear the first part of that song. Then Moses recited aloud every single word of this song to the entire assembly of Israel. Pay attention, heavens, and I will speak. Listen, earth, to the words from my mouth. Let my teaching fall like rain and my words settle like dew, like gentle rain on new grass and showers on tender plants. For I will proclaim the Lord's name, declare the greatness of our God. The rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are just. A faithful God without bias, he is righteous and true. His people have acted corruptly toward him. This is their defect. They are not his children, but a devious and crooked generation. Is this how you repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Isn't he your father and creator? Didn't he make you and sustain you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of past generations. Ask your father. And he will tell you, your elders, and they will teach you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance and divided the human race, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the people of Israel. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his own inheritance. He found him in a desolate land, in a barren, howling wilderness. He surrounded him, cared for him, and protected him as the pupil of his eye. He watches over his nest like an eagle and hovers over his young. He spreads his wings, catches him, and carries him on his feathers. The Lord alone led him, with no help from a foreign god. He made him ride on the heights of the land and eat the produce of the field. He nourished him with honey from the rock and oil from flinty rock, curds from the herd and milk from the flock with the fat of lambs, rams from Bashan and goats, with the choicest grains of wheat, you drank wine from the finest grapes. Then Jeshurun became fat and rebelled. He became fat, bloated, and gorged. He abandoned the God who made him and scorned the rock of his salvation. They provoked his jealousy with different gods. They enraged him with detestable practices. They sacrificed to demons, not God, to gods they had not known new gods that had just arrived, which your ancestors did not fear. You ignored the rock who gave you birth. You forgot the God who gave birth to you. When the Lord saw this, he despised them, angered by his sons and daughters. He said, I will hide my face from them and will see what will become of them. For they are a perverse generation, unfaithful children. They have provoked my jealousy with what is not a God. They have enraged me with their worthless idols. 
So I will provoke their jealousy with what is not a people. I will enrage them with a foolish nation. For fire has been kindled because of my anger and burns to the depths of Sheol. It devours the land and its produce and scorches the foundations of the mountains. I will pile disasters on them. I will use up my arrows against them. They will be weak from hunger, ravaged by pestilence and bitter plague. I will unleash on them the wild beasts and with fangs, as well as venomous snakes that slither in the dust. Outside the sword will take their children, and inside there will be terror. The young man and the young woman will be killed, the infant and the gray-haired man. I would have said, I will cut them to pieces and blot out the memory of them from mankind, if I had not feared provocation from the enemy, or feared that these foes might misunderstand and say, our own hand has prevailed. It wasn't the Lord who did all this. Our New Testament reading is from Matthew chapter 20, as we listen to Jesus teach us the parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius, he sent them into his vineyard for the day. When he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, you also go into my vineyard and I will give you what is right. So off they went. About noon and about three, he went out again and did the same thing. Then about five, he went and found others standing around and said to them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they said to him. You also go into my vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired about five came, they each received one denarius. So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more, but they also received a denarius each. When they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These men put in one hour, and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day's work and the burning heat. He replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Are you jealous because I'm generous? So the first will be last and the last first. Our writing for today comes from Valerius Herberger as he considers the parable of the workers in the vineyard which we just read. This gospel cannot be praised enough because of its kindness for it is extraordinarily comforting to repentant and humble hearts who desire to be saved. This is the center, let no one doubt our salvation does not consist in our good works, but only and merely on the fact that the Heavenly Father is so kind. Our salvation is based simply on the mercy, grace, and kindness of the Heavenly Father, which the Lord Jesus earned on the cross with his bloody, sour work. But this text is also very frightening to all puffed up, proud spirits, whose hearts are swollen up in arrogance like an oven, and who build on their own holiness. In this gospel, there are three words that are the foundational pillars on which the whole building of this text rests. First, there is the vineyard. Into the vineyard, one must go and not stand idly in the world sin, worldly sin market. Second, it, is, speaks, it speaks of the work. This must be done, whether it is much or little. Idle grape gorgers do not belong in the vineyard. Third, it mentions the loving heart of the Heavenly Father, who is so kind. In distress and death, one must comfort himself with him alone, for by our works we are lost. We merit only pure wrath. Pay attention to these three pages, and the entire gospel will become light and clear for you. For the goal and purposes of the gospel is goal and purpose of the gospel is not directed to who gets the coin, as some people have broken their heads on this question, yet have only been made worse but to the question of who retains the grace of the Heavenly Father, who is so kind. 
Our hymn stanza comes from the hymn, By Grace I'm Saved. By grace, none dare lay claim to merit. Our works and conduct have no worth. God in his love sent our Redeemer, Christ Jesus, to this sinful earth. His death did for our sins atone, and we are saved by grace alone. And we pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, since we cannot stand before you relying on anything we have done, help us trust in your abiding grace and live according to your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you so much for spending this time in God's word with me today. God richly bless your day. And I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.